When I was growing up in Pentecost, I'll tell you, we had testimonies. We had about an hour worth of testimonies. Just want to, um, you know, praise God, give him all the glory for Alex because of prayer. Um, he just consistently reminds me of how powerful prayer is. Um, and it's funny because Priscilla had said this morning about um, he's... He, we should be just worshiping him at all times. We shouldn't just be going to him only when we need something, when we want something. And I was very down this week because getting scared uh, to find out that my bl son's blood levels are really low, his white blood count and the red blood cells. And of course, you gotta love technology because then you start Googling things, which you know you shouldn't do. Um, so then it comes fear and worry. But I had to just, you know, basically rebuke um, the devil and tell him that he's a liar and that God was going to come through and take care of my son and he did but even in that time of need I just kept praising him and worshiping him because no matter what God is good even during that times of darkness and sadness yes, and um, he just reminded me of that and I just wanted to share and thank you God for taking care of my son amen amen God does answer prayer amen anyone else yes Speak loud, though, so we can hear you. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. That's right. And I remember a couple of years ago, I told you, I said, God's got a house for you somewhere. He's going to provide it for you somehow. He's going to do a, a great miracle. And he did. Praise God. Hallelujah. God is good. Amen. <clears throat> well, I, wanna, I would like to share with you this morning, God will fulfill his purpose for me. Say that with me. God will fulfill his purpose for me. God has a purpose and a plan for you. But so many times we always want God's blessing, but we don't want to go through the process. Amen? We need to go through a process sometimes. <clears throat> See, you might heard of this uh, magazine or newspaper called The Inquirer. And that the uh, kind of the sp sponsored line they always use, inquiring minds need to know. And see, <laughs> poor Jen, she went through so much looking up on the internet about the low blood cells and the white and the red and, and got all this information. Well, it could be this, it could be that, and some serious things it could have been. Because inquiring minds want to know. We want to know sometimes things that we shouldn't even bother looking into or worrying. My mother was the, I think the, she was the, she probably had a trophy this big on worrying. She worried about any, everything. And I remember as a new Christian, I happened to stumble across a book about worry. And I went out and I bought her that book to try to help her. Do you know she lost the book and was all worried about it, couldn't find it? That's a true story. That's true, what I'm telling you. She lost the book, could not find it, and she was so worried what she had done with that book. I'll tell you, it's amazing what worrying and things can happen when we just simply need to trust God. You know, when uh, I got that certificate to go up in that plane, you know, of course the enemy says, I'm going to crash it on you, you're going to die, and what if the pilot passes out? You're going to know what to do, and, uh, you know, how are you going to call the tower, and all this other stuff, and all this stuff goes through your brain, you know. But you know, you just, you have to not allow those voices to control your life. Because you won't do anything. Well, I better not leave my house because the house might burn down. I better not drive my car because I might get into an accident. You know, the devil wants to create phobias in our life. But I, I want to just say, God will fulfill his purpose for me, and by his grace and for his glory, he will do it. 
If you have your Bibles with me, please turn to the book of Philippians this morning. I promise I won't share too long. Some of you may have some plans and you may uh, be wanting to go and have a, a nice weekend with your family or go somewhere. And I know some of you may have to leave early today and if you do, that's okay. We already took the offering, so we're good. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, we're missing Edie today. That's who we're missing. I'm usually, I like to see people sit. They usually sit in their same seat. And, and that's something how we get so uh, into a, a, a system where we always seem to sit in the same spot all the time. And if somebody's sitting in our chair, oh, my Lord Jesus, help us. Uh, you know, Katie, bar the door, you know. If you'll turn with me, please, to Philippians chapter 3. And before I give you the verse this morning, I want to ask you a question. How many of you at times, and we had such a great service last week. I'll tell you, we talked about the naked church. And people's eyeballs got way big. They didn't understand what I was talking about. But I'm not talking about a physical nakedness. I was talking about the spiritual how the Bible says in Hebrews 4.13 that everything is open and naked before God and that we have, we have to be real with God, we have to be open with God because he sees it all anyway. And if we're trying to put on a facade with God, then God sees through that and he won't deal with us until we become real. But how many of us oftentimes as Christians, we, we sense to always think about how much we're not doing. Or we sense how much that we haven't gained or we haven't grown or we haven't done certain things as Christians. But I want to encourage you this morning because the Apostle Paul was considered one of the greatest, if not the greatest apostle that ever lived because of what he had done for Christ and what he had given up for Christ. And he says these words so plainly. And, 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 and before I get into the text this morning, can I just read the, the, the little thing before that, what he said? Because it gives us a better understanding. And I always believe that. If you're going to read a scripture, and you're going to read a text in scripture, always read the scriptures before it and after it, so you can get the full, you know, the full story of it before you make an interpretation determination. Of chapter 3, I want to just say this. Starting with verse 4. Now, this is just my introduction. This is not my message. But I just want to share this as a background so you can know where the Apostle Paul is coming from. He says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof, he might trust in the flesh. He says, I the more. He says, I was circumcised the eighth day out of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. Wow. If you reached the level of a Pharisee, man, you, had it, you were esteemed highly in society. Because they were the pious ones. They were the religious ones. They were the ones that were dedicated to the, uh, to the Torah and to the Talmud of the Jewish religion. They were the ones that were sacrificial. and They were the ones that were up in the front. and They were the ones that were doing things for the Lord. He says, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. He was zealous for God. And when this new way came along, which were Christians, and he saw it as a threat to, to Judaism, with every fiber of his being, he attacked it against it. Because he thought he was doing God a favor. He thought he was doing something for God by, by trying to wipe out this new way that was coming. He says, as touching the righteousness which is in the law, he was blameless. Didn't mean he was sinless. It meant he was blameless because what he would do is he had the sin offerings and he would do every sin offering he had to do, every feast he had to do, everything that the law required, he would do it. He would do it with a sacrifice and the covering of the blood. We talk about the high priest and going into the Holy of Holies on Wednesday and being a, uh, being a, a mediator for us. He went through all of that. But then verse 7 says something. When something happened with Paul to dramatically change his outlook. I talked about this maybe a couple of months ago when I preached about Paul 
and uh, uh, maybe it was about six months ago, about how that we can prove that Christianity is real because the transformation in the Apostle Paul, who went from, from a Christian hater, a Christian killer, a Christian imprisoner that would imprison Christians, to totally changing 180 degrees or 360 degrees to becoming a defender of the faith, something had to transpire in his life. We talked about that. But he says this in verse 7. All those things, being a Hebrew of Hebrew, being a scholar, being a PhD today, if you will, sitting under the feet of Gamaliel, one of the greatest teachers of Israel's time, a Pharisee of the tribe of Benjamin, of the stock of Israel, from the very cream of the crop. But this is what he says in verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Those things that were gained to me, I count it lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless. And I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. Just turn this down a little bit, Bob, for me, please. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, of whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Before you can have the purpose of God for your life, and my life, before we can obtain that, we have to come to the place and come to the conclusion that we are willing to lose everything for Christ. And once we do that, once we do that, God will fulfill his promise. God will do what he said he will do. But what God wants for us to do is to trust him when, he's, when we're going through something or something is happening in our life, to trust him and not to go looking on the computer and trying to figure it out and get all anxious and trying to say, oh God, you know, what, are we, what am I going to do? Uh, do I have to get him some of this? Do I got to do this? No, God doesn't want you to do that. God says, put him in my hands. Put the situation in my hands. He says, but I want to count all things as, as dung. You know what dung is, right? I don't have to explain that, right? Do I have to explain that? You sure? How about you, Ryan? Do I have to explain that? You know what dung is? Okay. He's staring at space at me. He's looking at me like this. That I may win Christ and be found in him. Now look at this. This is all necessary for you to get the next, my, my text this morning. I'll get to it. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness. He counted his own righteousness as dung. Because the Bible says our righteousness is as filthy rags. He said, but I count, he says, but not having my own righteousness, which is of the what? So that means that you keep up a standard, you keep doing this, you keep doing that to obtain righteousness. No. He says, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ Jesus. The righteousness which is of God by works. No, what does it say? <laughs> faith, not works. Which is of God by faith. It's not by your works. Your faith comes first and the works will prove your faith. You just don't have faith and sit back and say, okay, I got faith, but there's no works to what you're saying. Then the Bible says, like in James, your faith is dead. It doesn't work. But if you say a man says he has faith, then he'll show you that faith by his works. But the works don't come without faith. Without faith in what? 
Faith that Jesus' righteousness is imputed to us if we believe it. I stand before God, you stand before God, and we're accepted by God, not because of our righteousness, but because of Christ's righteousness. Because of Christ, we are righteous before God. Amen? Next verse, he says this. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings that I may know him and the power of his resurrection how do you come to know the power of his resurrection I'm asking a question it is rhetorical How do you come to know him and the power of his resurrection? How do you come to know the power of his resurrection? Can anyone tell me? Hmm? It comes through identification. Romans 6 says, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. It comes through identification. It's not just something theological that we have of, of a certain system of theology that we put in our brain and a, and a fact of truth and we just put it in our brain and there's no application to it. How you and I know the power of his resurrection, hallelujah, is what my former pastor George Cudi used to say and sing that song, the things I used to do, I do them no more. The places I used to go, I go there no more. The things I used to say, I say them no more. There's a great change since I've been saved. Why? Because my old man was crucified with Christ. That's the power of the resurrection. Because my old man died on that cross. And when Christ rose from the grave, the Bible says, because he did that, I can now walk in newness of life, not newness of law. So that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings. How do I have fellowship with his sufferings? Well, if you have anything in your life that you need to die to, it's painful. Hello? There are certain things that God said to you, no, you can't. And you want it. And you want to do it. And you stamp your feet before God and say, God, I want to do this thing. I want this. Things you go through in life are painful. God says no. You may go to college in another year, and you get on that campus. I want you to understand one thing. To two people, there's two different campuses that you're going to attend. The one you're going to attend is Bible College, and the other one is Bridal College. Bridal College. The men look at Bridal College, that they're going to meet a bride. And so you're going to have four guys come to you and say yes, or maybe more. Okay. They're going to say God showed me, you're the one for me. And you're going to hear God's voice, and you're going to learn God's, before you go. And know when God says, and don't get all emotional, and get all tickled pink, and all feelings and emotions running, and making a decision. No, you got to, and God says, that's not the one. Because believe me, that happens in schools. When I went to Zion, I went to Zion for a semester, and I was there, and uh, uh, the, uh, the, the dorm, the men's dorm guy there, whatever they call him, the headmaster of the dorm there, uh, he was talking, he was laughing in the hallway, so I went up to him, I said, John, what, it was John Cenero, I said, John, what's up? He said, you wouldn't believe it, I had four guys come up to me and tell me about this girl that God told them that he, they were going to marry this girl. So he says, somebody's wrong. <laughs> and it's the truth, okay? Because you've got to be very careful. And I thank God Priscilla went through three years 
without having to face that stuff. Maybe once or twice, maybe. I don't know. So maybe she's not telling me everything. The fellowship of his sufferings comes through identification also. As a Christian, now listen, as a Christian, when people make fun of you, or they mock you, or they ridicule you, or they speak all manner of evil against you, or they call you a Bible thumper, or they call you a name uh, because you're a Christian, that's part of the sufferings. When you go through loneliness and when you go through sorrows and grief and all the things that Jesus went through when it says in Isaiah, he went through that. Your identification with him, you'll go through similar things, maybe not to the same degree, but you'll go through those things and you will have a fellowship of his sufferings. You will know what it's like to be alienated. You will know what it's like for your family to turn their back on you. You will know what it is to friends leave you that were your best friends in the world, but they will not be your friend as a Christian. Being made conformable unto his death. What is it that we're conformed to? We're being conformed to, number one, his love. Because that's what put him there. Sacrifice. Willingness to die for somebody else. Hello. Being conformable unto his death. If by any means I may attain unto the resurrection from the dead. Now look at what he says here. Now listen. Now see, what I just read, you would say, wow, man, that's commitment. Man, the Apostle Paul was committed. I mean, he arrived. He was at the end. I mean, he's on the top. I mean, he's topped out as a Christian. He's, he's got to be the best Christian that ever lived. Wasn't it the Apostle Paul who said, I am the chief among sinners? Let's look at the next verse. This is my text this morning. Not as though I had already attained. What? Paul, just, I just described to you what he went through. He counted all things but loss and is dumb for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. All of that. Have we done that yet? Why haven't we done it? Because somewhere we've lost the identification of being crucified with Christ. Because when we're crucified with Christ, we're putting to death the lusts and the passions of the flesh. He says, not as though I had already attained. Either we're already, what? Perfect. God does not expect you to be perfect. That's liberating. Did you know that? God doesn't expect you to be perfect. But God expects you to do what's right with what you have and where you are and right where you are now. There may be other areas you say, oh, but pastor, there's other things in my life. I get. Yeah, right, one day at a time, sweet Jesus. One thing at a time. Let God work on you one thing at a time. Paul says, not as though I had already attained. Either we're already perfect. Apostle Paul was not perfect. I, I, I you know, I, sometimes I read these commentaries in people's, especially people of education. They put the Apostle Paul up on a pedestal way up here. And if he was alive, he'd say, don't put me up there. I don't want to be up there. I count even acknowledgement and all that stuff as dung. I don't want all of the accolades of man. So that I can have the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Some people do those things for, for the accolades and have success. No. It's like education. Some people go for education because they want to be important. Some people want education because it's simply for them. 
It's not to show off. It's not to show you how much knowledge they have and how many degrees they have. It's not about that. And as you go up in education, you should, it should make you humbler. It shouldn't make you more proud to say, I know more than somebody else. Or who do you think you are? I, I, have a, I have a PhD or I have a master's and who do you think you are? No. That's not what education is for. That's not what any of that's for. It can't perfect you. Always remember this. You can have all the knowledge in the world. But if you don't have application, you have zero. If you don't apply what you know, it doesn't matter what you know. Because all, you, all you're speaking is hyperbole. You're just speaking something off the top. You're just, it has no meaning. It, it doesn't have any, any root. It doesn't have any real solidity to it. But the only time it does have solidity, solidity to it is when you are living it. Amen. It's called living experience. He said, not that I have already attained, neither was already perfect. But I what? I follow after it. Why is he following after it? Because he's following Christ, who is perfect. So as we are following Christ, we're moving on toward perfection. Slow as it may be. Some of us are dragging our feet, but we're getting there. Hallelujah. But we're getting there. Slow but sure. Slow but sure. We're turning more and more things over. The light of the gospel shining more on our hearts. And we're getting closer and closer to that perfection. And I believe that one day what's going to happen is going to be a trump of God. And the dead in Christ are going to rise. And we which are alive and remain shall caught up with him that quick. Oops, I thought I lost something. That quick in the air. And at that moment, one hundred thousandths of a second, your mortality is going to put on immortality. Your corruption is going to put on incorruption. Somebody shout hallelujah. Your imperfections will become perfect. You will have no imperfections anymore. And then this is the greatest thing. Remember that cartoon, Peabody and Sherman, with Bullwinkle? You have to look it up on the computer. Okay. Bullwinkle. Sherman and Peabody. There was a guy, he was a little professor's name, was Mr. No, Mr. Uh, what was it? What was the dog's name? What was his name? Huh? Mr. Know-it-all. That was his name, Mr. Know-it-all. There were some people like that. You can't tell them anything. They know it all. They know everything. Huh? What you say? That's your husband? Is that what you say? Oh, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> she didn't say nothing. <laughs> just teasing. It's on the tape. <laughs> not that I'm already perfect. Some people think the past is perfect. I'm not perfect. Hello? I'm only human too. I'm not using that as an excuse, but I'm just telling you. I'm human too. Okay? Some people say, oh, you're so good, Pastor. Oh, you know, you, you give so much. And you do I, it's not me. If that was me, I'd say, get out of here. Leave me alone. Stop calling me. Don't pester me. But my life doesn't belong to me. Oh, don't get me wrong. Sometimes when people are getting on my nerves, I'm sitting on the phone going, and I can say, God, forgive me of my attitude. Hello? I'm real. I'm sorry. Sometimes, sometimes people aggravate me. But see, oh, that, oh, none of you would admit to that because, oh, you're all holy, you know. You won't admit that you get aggravated and stuff like that. But, oh, get in the car. <laughs> My wife is so sweet, isn't she? She has this little glow about her, you know, that little cute smile, and her eyes are all like, Oh, brother, you better get in the car with her someday. 
Backing out of my driveway, somebody came up the road, didn't let her go by. Oh, she does the Italian thing. What's up with you? What's the matter with you? How come you can't stop and let me out? <laughs> She's probably going to kill me. <laughs> and I was like, honey, check your attitude. What's wrong with these people? <laughs> Maybe Darren's already experienced some of that riding with her. I don't know. <laughs> He's laughing over there. Not as though I had already attained. My wife hasn't attained. I haven't attained. You haven't attained. None of you have attained. But he says, I follow after. My heart's desire. I don't walk around going, well, you know what? I'm not perfect. Oh, well. <laughs> no. I want to follow after because that's part of the crucified life. That's part of the, the identification of the resurrected Christ, that I want to know him in the power of his resurrection, of being, a, uh, being a, a selfless, not having an ounce of selfishness in my, in my life. You know, I've got to bring my car up Tuesday to have the brakes done and everything. I always say, this, this is my test. I keep hitting the flap or something on this thing. But... You know when you step on a car, on your brakes in the car, and the car goes, blah, 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 blah. your pedal goes like that? That's what's happening to my car. Well, you figure it's what? 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. At six years old, I have never done the brakes. So I'm like, oh, great. Okay, now I've got to do the brakes. My car's not cheap. So I'm looking at 700 maybe, somewhere around there. Okay. So I said, well, I've got to call. Now, I said, I'll wait till I come back. No, something told me, no, don't call now. So I call a guy, and I said, listen, i got to get a price on my brakes because, you know, the, the, pedals, when I, the pedals vibrating and the thing's shaking when I step on the brakes. He said, Mr. Langer, let me check. He says, um, do you have less than 100,000 miles? I said, yes. He says, your warranty runs out September 11th. He says, I'll get you in Tuesday, he says, and we'll do all the warranty work for you that needs to be done on your car. Bring it up to date. Do all the brakes. Get it all done for free. Hello. Now I'm leaving on Wednesday, I, so I got to go up to Boston Tuesday. Get this all done. And he says to me, "Oh, and by the way, he says that's the only day I have a loaner car that I can give to you." Praise God. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. That I may apprehend that. What is that? What's he talking about? That I may apprehend that. What is that? It's the previous verses I read to you. That I may know him. And the power of his resurrection. The fellowship of his sufferings. Being conformed into his image. For which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Remember, Paul was a devil. Okay, he was a religious devil, but he was a devil. How did Christ apprehend him? If you want to be serious with God, if you want to be serious with, with Jesus, if you want to have a relationship with him, and you want to be sold out for him, listen to me now, you want to be sold out for Jesus, understand the Apostle Paul was an intellect. You couldn't just walk up to him and just go, hey, you know, Jesus loves you. That wouldn't work with him. Otherwise, that would have happened. Somebody would have went up to him and told him, hey, you know Jesus loves you and cares for you, died for you, so that, you know, once you receive him. Oh, okay. No. Let me tell you, it's very hard to reach an intellect. Paul was an intellectual. What had to happen, sometimes even with us, we may not have degrees, but we are, we're intellectuals. I ain't believing it till I see it. But 
what changed the Apostle Paul? What he apprehended of Christ Jesus, he says, that I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. That apprehending that he experienced was this. He had an encounter. And I want to challenge anyone here this morning, anyone, if you will get down on your knees and really seriously, 100%, from your heart, say, God, I'm having a problem believing. I'm having a problem like the Apostle Paul. I'm an intellect. I, I just can't, doesn't compute this stuff, compute in my brain. But I'm on my knees, God, and I'm submitting to you and to your Lordship. And I'm asking you right now, prove it to me. He will. He will. He had an encounter. Here's Paul going out to persecute the church. Oh, I'm going to kill those Christians, those big mouths always running through the neighborhood talking about Jesus. All I hear is about Jesus, Jesus, your Messiah, 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 Messiah. Drive me nuts. Can't go down the road without hearing about the Messiah. Messiah over here, Messiah over there, miracle over here, healing over here, deliverance over here, demon, demon flying over here. Can't go to the store and get a glass of milk without somebody saying, hey, Jesus, you know, healed Jesus. Um. And here he is walking down the road. Some people say he was riding a horse. Some people say he was walking. Some people say he was on a camel. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. It doesn't change the context. Whether he was walking, he was on a camel, whether he was flying, whether he, whatever, I don't care. All I know is something happened. The Bible says a light shone down from heaven. He had an encounter, knocked him on the ground. He had a vision and he heard a voice. And you know the amazing thing about it is if you go into Acts chapter 9, you'll see that the people heard the voice too. They didn't see anything, but they heard a voice. Boy, if we had a bunch of psychologists back there, they would say they're all psychosis. They're all, something's wrong with them. They're hearing voices, put them on meds. <laughs> They're schizophrenic. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> They're all hearing voices. But they all heard the same voice say the same thing. Oh, that's something different now. And the voice from heaven came down, t tells Paul, he calls him by name. He says, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? Yeah. Huh? I wasn't persecuting Jesus. Jesus was in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. How, were, how was Paul persecuting Jesus? Well, let me tell you something. When they persecute you and me, they're persecuting him. So if they've done it to you, they've done it as unto me. That's why, watch what you say to your fellow Christian. Because you might be doing it as unto him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for thee to kick, you know, kick against the pricks. He goes, is that you, Lord? And then he says this. Let me just read that to you. And the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and he hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. But look at verse 15, chapter 9 of Acts. But the Lord said to him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must be blessed for my name's sake. Huh? Isn't that what it says? Yeah, you're shaking your head, amen, you're not reading it. How much he must be blessed for my name's sake, I said. No. Not so that you can be blessed, although you will be blessed, but that's not your motivating factor. This is for the much things that you must suffer for my name's sake. That doesn't mean you're going to get your head cut, and cut off, your, your nails ripped out. That's not what it's talking about. It's about people that will want your friend coming to you and to your face and say, I hate you. 
I don't want nothing to do with you, sick Christian. It's about emotional things. It doesn't always have to be physical. Somebody chopping your head off, cutting your hand off. It can be emotional. Friends, I say, I don't want nothing to do with you since you become a Christian. You're one of those fanatics, Bible thumpers. I go, yeah, I might. Hey, thank you, Lord. Mm-hmm. I'm a Bible thumper. They say, yeah, yeah, so sick, you're brainwashed. I say, ah, my brain's been washed in the blood of Jesus. Thank you. Amen. Devil's in the phone booth. Dial 911. Saints are on their knees loading up their spiritual gun. Devil thought he had us, but the tables are turned. Now he's on the run. Devil's in the phone booth. Dial 911. And I like it. Hallelujah. Back to Philippians. Verse 13. I'll be done in a few minutes. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. Paul didn't think he was perfect. Paul didn't think he already reached the goal. So that should make you, and if he was way up ahead of us, that means we still got a little ways to go, but you know what? We don't have to be condemned. He's not, even he didn't apprehend it. So guess what? Stop sweating it. I got to be better. I got to be good. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to slow down. Let God take you to those areas. Let him take you to the next step. Let him take you to the next step. Because if you try to get there on your own, you're going to make it happen in the flesh, and it ain't going to last. He said, not come with myself, have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Say this with me. This one thing I do. The next phrase on this and the next truth in this is this. If you're not willing to forget and, and remove your past, now you won't totally forget it. But I'm going to tell you, there's things that I have forgotten. I'll be somewhere and I'll smell a smell or something will happen. It'll bring back a trigger memory to me. And I'll go, wow, I don't believe I used to do that. I forgot all about that. So you don't have to drag your past around with you. I wish I had a dummy so I could show you what it's like. No, I'm not going to pick any on anybody here. But I wish I had a dummy that I could drag around with. Them. Because, you know, that's what we think we're doing. We're dragging our past with us, what we used to do. But for the key, the key of the success of you living as a Christian, not apprehending yet, not arriving, but this one thing I do. You need to get that in your spirit. One thing God wants you to do in order to start the ball rolling is what? Everyone say the word, forgetting those things which are what? Well, pastor, you don't understand. I only got a fifth grade education. I don't care. That's behind you. God can teach you. God can give you instruction. God can give you what you need. In fact, the Bible says he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He's given us everything we need. The reason why, the reason why we don't get everything we need from God is because we don't go shopping in God's supermarket. We don't take the time to go through the aisles of what God has for us. Aren't you glad market baskets open? Praise God. Hallelujah. One thing I do, one thing, just one thing. Forgetting those things which are behind. That means all your failures, all the things that you've done, all the things that you're ashamed of, all of those things, you need to get rid of them out of your memory bank. In other words, uh, the only person I know that's good at that is Bob, because Bob, you know, Ortiz, he knows how to clean hard drives. You got anything for the head, you know? Clean out your hard drive. Some of us, you know, we're so scattered. We've got everything scattered. You need to defrag. That means put everything in its proper component. Some of you need to really have a whole wipeout of your hard drive. But pastor, how do we do that? Is that mind over matter? No. How you do that is becoming identified with the power of the cross. 
when you crucified and you really believe it, that you are crucified with Christ, nevertheless you live, but not you, but Christ lives in you. Forgetting those things which are behind, because if you do not forget those things which are behind, they will become a stumbling block in your present life. Oh, when I was a kid, oh, this happened. Oh, when I was in church, the pastor did this to me. Oh, when I was this, the, I, had to, I went through this. Forget it. Forget it. Let it go. Forgetting those things which are behind. And then what? These are instructional. They're not just passive. This one thing I do. Nothing. No. No, there's two things you need to do. The first thing is you've got to forget those things which are behind. Because if you don't, they'll grab for your attention. You've got to keep your eye on something. I'd like you for one moment when you're going down, whatever road you're going down when you're driving your car, just to keep staring in the rear of your mirror. Don't look forward. Look in your rearview mirror. I'll guarantee you may be seeing where you've been, but you're not going to be knowing where you're going. <laughs> now, I don't suggest you really actually do that. So don't say, Pastor told me to do this, and I did it, and I crashed into a tree, ran over a dog, ran over a, ran, ran over a person, ran into a house, hit three parked cars, why is that? Why would that happen? Because you're not looking where you're going. You're looking where you were. So there's one thing you need to do. Forget those things which are behind and reach forth to those things which are before you. What is it you want to become? I want to become everything God has for me. I wish I could, I wish I could go back 20 years, maybe 25 years, and be where I am now. Have the thinking that I have now. Things would have been a lot different. Time that I've wasted wouldn't have been wasted. Forgetting those things which are behind. That's internal. And reaching forward to those things which are before you. That's expectation. God, I'm forgetting those things, and when I forget something, you're going to replace it with something better. <gasps> Who can I pick on? I'll pick on you. What? what? Huh? I know, but I love you, so. Okay. Here's an example. I'm in school and you're in school and, you know, we meet and we date and you fall in love with me and I fall in love with you, right? And we're having a romance, you know, and, and everything's wonderful. But then we go and pray and God says, no. Watch. God says, no. To either one of us, that's not the right one for you. But after all, we're in love, you know. You know, I just love you, and you just love me. And so, you know what? I disregard God, and I marry her. And five years into the marriage, I backslide. I'm not serving God anymore. I'm out drinking, drugging, having a good time. I'm sleeping with other women, and here's my poor, beautiful wife sitting home with her hands in her head saying, God, I wish I would have listened to you. Hello? Can I tell you, the pain will be more than if you had just said, you know what, let's obey God. I know it's going to hurt. I know it's, it's going to be uncomfortable for a little while, and I'm going to go through some emotions and some roller coaster feelings. But it's better that I go do that now and be right with God than to disobey him and go through the pain I'm going to have to go through later. 
Forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forward to those things which are before. Verse 14 is the final verse. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I press, what, forward. Not backwards. I press toward. When you're going toward something, you're, you're, you're in motion. You're not standing still. I'm moving toward. I'm going toward this perfection. I'm going toward Christ. I'm going to the things of God. I'm going to what the Bible says versus what man says. What the philosophers say. What the ideologists the ideologists say. I'm going by what God's word says. I don't care. I'm not going to go by what the doctor says. Although he's an expert and he knows this stuff, okay, I'm going to respect that. But I'm going to tell you something. I remember Pastor Monroe uh, told, said, gave his testimony one time how he went to the doctor. The doctor says, I got some bad news for you. He says, and you need to get your life in order because you're going to die. You've got about six months to live. Cancer is all through your body. And, you know, if anybody knows Pastor Monroe, he says, well, doc, you know, praise God, I, I accept your expertise and your professionalism, but you don't have the final say over this. God does. That was over 25 years ago. He's still alive. You follow what I'm saying? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. First Corinthians 9.24, could you put that up for me? I, I, I'm sorry, I, I forgot I had this other scripture. I'm not a liar. I forgot I had this other scripture. Know you not that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize? You see the Boston Marathon? Everyone watched the Boston Marathon one time or another, right? Or seen some kind of running event, right? There's a lot of people in that race, but only one gets the, gets the prize. Are you running your Christian life like that? Or is your attitude, well, let somebody else run. I don't care if I come in second. I don't care if I come in third. No, your desire should be to obtain the prize. I'm going to do the best I can. I'm going to run the hardest I can. I, oh, here's the part we don't like. I'm going to train. Hello? Talk about exercising and training just for the sake of, you know, whatever, losing weight or whatever, right? Getting stronger. But can I tell you something? Sitting on a lazy boy chair with your feet up, saying that, saying that I'm going to get stronger, God, I'm going to exercise, and having good intentions is not going to cut it. Amen. I'm going to lose weight. Someday. <laughs> Someday will never come. Until you get up off of that chair, off of that couch, and you put the goal before you, and you say, okay, I want to lose 30 pounds. I'd love to lose 30 pounds. You say, well, Pastor, you'd be so skinny. No, I got it all here. But unless you take the effort, unless you say, you know what, I'm getting up, I'm going to get in shape, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to run this race because I want to receive the prize. When I stand before God, I want God to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, because you've done everything in your power to serve me, to put me first in your finances, in your home, in your marriage, with your children, with witnessing for me, with going on mission trips or whatever God has for you. How many, now honestly thinking, honestly now, how many of you ever thought you'd go on a mission trip? Or you'd even leave the country to go on a mission trip? No. Oh, but to go to uh, San Diego, or go to Florida, or go on a cruise, or go to the Bahamas, or to Cancun, Mexico, all those places. We don't have any problem with that. Because we're going for what? Entertainment. 
to pamper the flesh. Hello? But guess what? That's not going to help you win the race. You know, spending $30,000 on your bathroom and $60,000 on your kitchen, remodeling everything, and you have a nice $400,000 home, guess what? When you stand before God, it's all going to burn. You can't go to God, hey, look, do you like my kitchen? you like the colors I chose and my curtains and everything else? God can say, that doesn't mean anything to me. Yeah, you did all of that, and you, you spent money, you got the best car, you got the best house, you got all that stuff, but guess what? Your neighbor just died and went to hell because you wouldn't open your mouth and tell him about me. What do you think is more important? So run that you may obtain the prize. And look what he says here. Now, this was Paul now talking. This was about himself. I'm going to run to win the prize. I'm going to... You know, put that before me, mark for the prize of the high calling of God. Then he says in verse 15, Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. So God wants you to be just minded just like he was when I read that to you. Well, you don't go, oh, well, that was for the Apostle Paul. That's not for me. Yes, it is. He says, be thus like-minded. Like you and I to be as like-minded as he is in this situation, in this circumstance. So I'm going to ask Tom to put up that slide for my... For my, my uh, Message again. Uh, yeah. God will fulfill his purpose for me. Do you believe that? Do you really? Now, I'll close with this question. God will fulfill his purpose for me. But do you believe that there's nothing that you have to do? Do you believe that you can just sit there and God's going to magically come over you like a fairy godfather and with a little tiny wand just go, boop, and it's going to happen? It's not going to be. I'm telling you, I have a friend. Haven't seen him in years, talked to him in years. But he said, I'm, I'm going to have a ministry. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. You know, God's timing, blah, 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 blah. It's been 25, 30, maybe 35 years. He's still waiting. Because unless you go out and you get a school and you, you get an advertisement in the paper or you go out knocking on doors or you go talk to somebody about Jesus, it isn't going to happen. Faith without works is dead. When he stands before God, that's his business. But God's going to say, look, I, I asked you to do that. And then don't blame everybody else. Don't blame because this person didn't come help me. Don't blame because of that. I ain't going to cut it with God. Well, I had a ministry, but nobody supported it. Well, why? Did you do it the right way or the wrong way? Did you do it your way or what you thought was right, or did you do it God's way? Hello? God will fulfill his purpose for you as long as you fulfill the purpose that he has for you and be active in what he's doing. God wants you to be active. And here's the word that we all hate. Now, I know we live in a society that is kind of tainted our thinking. And women don't like this word, some. Submission. My friend went to an all-women's conference one time, drove his wife up to New York, and he had to stay there because he had to drive her back, so they let him sit in the back of the auditorium. He sat in the back and the lady got up to speak. She says, I want to talk about one word today and that word is submission. The whole crowd groaned. <gasps> he said, I couldn't believe it. The groan that came out of women. You want to know why? I don't, in a sense, I don't blame them because men have treated them like objects rather than people. And they haven't loved them like Christ loves the church. But that's still no excuse not to be submissive. And that doesn't mean you have to obey their every whim. If they want you to sin, no. If they want you to go against this, no. Respectfully. God will fulfill his purpose for me and for you as long as we come into cooperation with him and his will. If we're willing to do that, God will use your life. instead of Think about it. There's going to be people that go before God and they're going to be wailing and crying. 
Yeah, because the Bible says he's going to wipe away all tears when you're in heaven. Yeah, but you're going to, you're going to cry. You're going to be sorrowful. When you had so much potential that God wanted to use you so greatly and you limited him in your life because you will not participate in what God wants to do. And all you have to do is say, yes, Lord. All you're going to do is be willing. God, fulfill, my, fulfill your purpose in my life. Can we all stand and say that together? Last week we talked about naked and open before him. God moved. Now the Bible says, before you make a vow unto God, do, do not be rash with your mouth. Ecclesiastes. Don't make a vow to God and you're not going to keep it. Right? But if you mean business, say this with me. God, fulfill your purpose for me. I'm willing to cooperate with your spirit. I am willing to submit to the cross so that you can live your life through me. In Jesus' name. Now I'm going to pray. Father, I pray for each and every one of us, including myself, let this proclamation, this profession of our faith today be true in your ears and be binding in our hearts. And God will not fail to give you the glory and the honor and the praise because you are worthy. And we love you this morning, God. We love you with all our hearts. Help us to understand and to know that you are God and beside you there is no other God. And we thank you. God, thank you that you don't expect us to be perfect, but you just expect us to submit to you and for you to help us, Lord, through the tough times we go through and the tough situations we find ourselves in. And God will not fail to give you the glory because, God, you truly love us and care about us. And we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen. God bless you this morning. You got a testimony. Hold on one minute. She's got a testimony. Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. I had that major rash yeah. Monday. It's all gone. I was, thank God I didn't have to go to God. Praise the Lord. Yeah, we prayed for that. God answers prayer in the morning. Yeah, if you want to. Sure. He's, he's walking out now. We're getting his hat. 